Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming today. I am uh, overjoyed for two reasons. One is this is International Women's Day, and uh, I belong to an organization that believes that uh, total equality is one of the basic um, uh, principles of life. And in fact, we describe man and woman as wings of one bird called humanity. So uh, it, it, it's a nice metaphor. Um, I knew that uh, Margaret, or Greta, as I'll call her, that's what she was called by her husband and also by <coughs> all the family. Oops, I may have broken something there. I'm putting the lights down slightly, is that all right? Is that all right? Can you see the slides all right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was only last year on the 1st of April when I finally retired after decades um, that I got down to writing a book about her. I knew she was famous in India. I had a book that thick that they wrote together. She and her husband is called We Two Together. Where did my notes go to, by the way? I had them sitting in. Sorry. Panic, panic. Um, and it's quite a hard read because they do alternate chapters and sometimes time lines are out of sync and so on, but it is a brilliant book and there's a lot more in it even than uh, uh, in my book because what I've done, and that's why I called it Through the Eyes of Margaret Cousins, she wrote this book with her husband and she's quoted and quoted. These are her words linked together by me. Uh, and so we get a picture straight from the I wouldn't say the horse's mouth, but, but straight from her heart and her mind. And she had a great skills of English, uh, and he was an Irish poet, so their style of writing is good. So uh, historically, I believe that this book, We Two Together, which is freely available uh, on the internet to download, uh, is of great um, historical significance. We'll head off, and I'm just giving it an overall view uh, of what really is in the book with an awful lot more to it. Uh, afterwards, if any of you have a desire to purchase, then I will sit and I can sign one for you, if you wish. Now, we start with a donkey, and you'll know in a minute why. But she said when she was quite young, I saw that it was counted a kind of curse in those days to be born a woman. A girl, one of my missions in life, equal rights for men and women, was finding me. Now this is back, she was born in 1878, so this is quite forward thinking uh, in those years in the 80s. Then she tells a story about her donkey. Aha, enter donkey. When I was about eight years old, I innocently threw my leg across the saddle of my donkey when the stirrup of the lady's side saddle broke. A friend of my father met me in the heterodox manner and reported his amusement to my very proper papa. When I returned home, I got well spanked for behaving in such an unladylike way. That was my introduction to the inequality of opportunity, which then belonged to being a girl I was a born natural equalitarian and rebelled exceedingly from that early age against any differential treatment of the sexes. So here you have a young feisty girl from Boyle in Roscommon who had a good education there and uh, already at that age she is um, you know, beginning to realize that man and woman should be equally treated again ahead of her time. She won a scholarship um, to Londonderry for three years, but that was extended to four. And she went to school in the Victoria High School for girls in Derry. And this is it today. Well, later on, I'll explain who this is. Well, I'll explain now. She formed the All India Women's Conference later, which you'll hear about in India. But uh, I brought the 
current president at that time in 1994 to put a plaque on our house in Boyle, which you'll see later, but also to do a little pilgrimage. So this is at the top of Crawford Square in Derry and was at that time the Victoria High School for Girls. The headmistress, a Miss McKillop. Today it is morphed into what is known as Foyle College. And uh, I'm in negotiation with Foyle College to get something big done about Greta's history. She's probably, maybe I'm a little prejudiced, but she's probably one of the most famous women to come out of our school uh, in all those years. <coughs> Miss McKillop, Greta's headmistress, gave her advice just before she left. She advised me that I should not be so independent. Life would be easier for me if I was more like other girls. I listened to her politely and often recalled her words. But my nature was free and original in its bent. I could be happy only in doing what I felt was right in principle, not because other people did it. Again, her um, feisty personality was emerging. She studied music in Dublin, especially piano, and was awarded the Bachelor of Music from the Royal University of Ireland in October 1902. I hazard a guess, I haven't actually found that yet, but she was probably one of the first women um, to be granted that as well, but I can't say that for sure yet. I'm focusing on what she says in her book. I haven't added anything else uh, or taken anything else away. Like many girls her age, she formulated an image of an ideal man. She didn't want to be left on the shelf. He must be tall and dark, a professor with a beautiful voice. I don't know if that's the same today for ladies, but that's what she had. Her dreams were crushed when he materialized, my great uncle. My great uncle Jim was small and fair, an accountant. How boring for her. Sorry, I hope there's no accountants in the audience. I need an accountant every year. Shouldn't have said that. Worst of all, he spoke with a strong North of Ireland accent, which he detested. He had one saving grace. He was a poet. Now, he was born not a mile and a half from here in a street that doesn't exist anymore. And he was actually secretary to the Lord Mayor before he moved to Dublin and married my great aunt. So I'm probably the nearest to his accent that she was hearing all those decades ago. I'm only hazarding, I guess. After a three-year engagement, they married in the Methodist Church in Sandymount. After a lot of heart searching, she became a vegetarian, like Jim as well as a strong advocate for theosophy, like Jim. Both became immersed in the green ocean of the Celtic revival. Both, mostly Jim, were associated with the Irish Literary Theatre, the National Dramatic Society, the Abbey Theatre and the Theatre of Ireland. Jim was not only a poet, he was a playwright as well. The visits of actors to their home introduced Greta to the world of drama in Dublin. Amongst them were George Augustus Moore, James Joyce, Patrick Cullum. They also became friends with A.E., George Russell, and someone called William Butler Yeats. <laughs> After accidentally getting into a meeting of the National Council of Women in Manchester, Having gone there to Manchester to attend a conference on vegetarianism, she was an instant convert to the movement for women's franchise. Returning to Ireland, she consulted the leader of a local group, Anna Haslam. She was a pacifist, suffragist, suffragette, a little violent in things, but if you're a suffragist, you are completely pacifist. So she wasn't too happy when they were talking about the possibility of a, a younger, more feisty group being formed who may um, go on to break windows and so on, but they never harmed people. 
So in 19, you know, uh, around that time, this is my great uncle, and this was Greta at their age. They consulted their friends, Hannah and Frank Sheehy Skeffington, and all four felt that less pacifist approach was needed by the younger suffragists. On the 4th of November 1908, at the home of the Sheehy Skeffingtons, she and Jim convinced them that Ireland needed a more militant approach, as well as a particular Irish slant. So they decided to form the Irish Women's Franchise League, which was formally announced on the 7th of November. Within a fortnight, the IWFL had a word come boost. <coughs> Mary Gorthop, one of the recently imprisoned London suffragettes, had been invited to speak on the women's suffrage by the Solicitors' Apprentices Debating Society in Dublin. Tom Kettle, politician and poet, was to have been the second speaker, but unfortunately had to cancel, and as a result, Greta was offered the slot. She was, uh, uh, Mary Gorthop spoke to an audience of about a thousand people. She was a brilliant speaker who had sustained severe physical beatings as a result of her arrests and imprisonments. She was one of the suffragettes who spoke in Hyde Park to an audience of over 200,000 women in 1908. The first open air meeting of the Irish Women's Franchise League took place soon after on, sa on, uh, on a Saturday at the base of the Wellington Memorial Obelisk in Phoenix Park. Have, have any of you ever been there? Yep. Yep. Well, I took the picture so I have been there. But uh, I wasn't at 1908. <laughs> this is Mrs. Ramaday again here. It's not a good picture, really. And this is my wife uh, wearing a sari, incidentally. So we took a, you know, a picture. But that was where the first open air meeting took place uh, in 1908 of the Irish Women's Franchise League. Husbands supported their wives. But they stood back and let the woman uh, do the talking, as it were. In the summer of 1909, Greta offered her services for three weeks to the Women's Social and Political Union in London. This voluntary work consisted of chalking pavements with announcements of meetings and selling the newspaper Votes for Women. On return to Ireland, events moved quickly. Charlotte Despar came from England and spoke for and to the League. Charlotte was an Anglo-Irish suffragist, socialist, pacifist, Sinn Féin activist, and vegetarian. She was multifaceted and multi-layered woman. Very fascinating. Greta observed she was a leader of highest quality, an aristocrat, and one of the most democratic political thinkers. She was also one of those rare Catholics who had become a theosophist. It's another string to her bow. To top it all, she was sister, you like this one, sister of the future and final British Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, which made for interesting conversations between brother and sister. The biggest venture of the IWFL was a visit in March of 1910 of Christabel Pankhurst, illustrious daughter of Emily. That's a photo of the little ticket that people you know, were sold. That was two shillings to get into the rotunda at that time. Dublin's largest hall was packed to the gunnels with 3,000 people. As Greta put it, she came, we heard, and saw, she conquered. This is Greta's description of Christabel. Christabel's personality was charming. She disarmed criticism, she was young, slight, fair, pretty, well-dressed, with a clear and telling voice. She was very clever with a natural flair for politics and promotional strategy. She was in her 26th year 
when she took Dublin by storm. She was the brain of the campaign, the political secretary of the Women's Social and Political Union. I had occasion to travel with her in Ireland and saw how, when she had finished a speaking engagement, she curled up like a kitten and conserved every atom of energy for her public work. Sincerity, concentration, intrepid courage, determination, a belief that they were women of destiny, were characteristics of the Pankhurst family, which included daughter Sylvia as well. In October of that year, Greta was responsible for organising public meetings for Emmeline Pankhurst in Cork and in Londonderry. She describes what happened. I went a week in advance to Cork to arrange a reception committee of women and to enlist new sympathisers and organise the meeting. The town hall had a capacity audience and I felt very happy at the ovation she received from my country people on her first appearance in Ireland. I then travelled with her from Cork to Dublin. Quickly I'm adding a little story here. They stopped in Mallow Station. There was a train without a corridor and Emmeline asked Greta to go and telegram her office in London about something. So Greta dutifully did that but came out onto the platform to see the train leaving the station. Now, this word feisty stays with Greta throughout her entire life. She didn't say, oh my God, I'll have to wait for the next train. She jumps down on the railway line, runs across and climbs up to another compartment and the people in that compartment pull her in through the window and she sits with them till the next station and then she can get out and go back to Emily. Interesting little side story to add to her uh, determinations. Now, although I was born in uh, Belfast, around Stormont, I'm really, you know, 50 odd years in Derry, so therefore, you know, this is my city up there. So this is St. Columns Hall. Greta then travelled on to Derry to organise a large meeting at the Guildhall. However, fire had destroyed all except the clock tower during Easter 1908. Most functions had been transferred to St. Columns Hall within a stone's throw. On Friday the 7th of October 1910, the Irish Women's Franchise League public meeting was held. The packed hall heard Emmeline Panker speak as well as Greta. The Derry Standard um, no longer um, well, it left this world many, many decades ago, that newspaper, uh, printed a long article published on the following Monday morning. It was headed, Visit of Mrs. Pankhurst, large gathering in St. Columns Hall what women want and how they are to get it. Now, the full text of that meeting is in the book. I'm just dangling a little interest there for you. you know? uh, and it is interesting to see even who the mayor was and what he was involved in and the welcome and so forth. So it's interesting. You see, she'd been to school there for four years. This was ten years later and she came back as this notorious um, suffragette when her headmistress told her to you know, just be normal. So it was an interesting, um, she stayed with Miss McKillop while she was in Derry. Prior to leaving Ireland, Mrs. Panker said that for 50 years successive British governments had used every form of tactic to prevent securing of a woman suffrage bill. She expected a further deputy um, deputation would be sent in November to the Prime Minister Herbert Asquith so uh, to protest against the omission of suffrage from the party mandate in the upcoming general election. Red immediately volunteered to make up the deputation. There and then I rose from my seat and volunteered for militant action knowing it would result in my imprisonment. I knew that if I discussed my decision with relatives or friends, they would feel bound to try to save me from suffering. It was my own responsibility. 
and I felt my own privilege. My dear husband upheld and helped me, he being an enthusiastic as, as enthusiastic and revolutionary as I was myself. Six women from Dublin travelled to London in November 17. They took part in the Parliament of Women that met in Caxton Hall, Westminster, <coughs> and from which 400 women in groups of 12, they were allowed to go in groups of 12, made their way towards the House of Commons. Following rebuffs for the deputation, they decided to first break the windows of the houses of cabinet ministers. The Irish suffragettes, with a few of their London colleagues, set out on the 20th of November for the home of the Honourable Augustine Birra, the Chief Secretary for Ireland. Greta again. Our missiles were potatoes which we bought on the way and carried in our pockets and muffs. There was not a policeman in sight as we broke all the windows within our reach. Later, at our prearranged rendezvous, we heard that over 200 women had, uh, who had broken government glass had been arrested, but the windows of Asquith and Lloyd George were intact as Downing Street had been too well guarded. As we Irish women were free, it fell to our lot to carry on the fight. We waited till midnight when Anna Garvey, Kelly and I, along with some male supporters, were escorted to the corner of Downing Street. <coughs> the November fog was so thick that we could not see across the street or make out the group preceding us. My escort was Captain Gong of the Royal Artillery, a cousin of Maud Gaunt. He left us after pointing out that this is Downing Street, go straight up there. So he more or less pointed them in the, uh, in the direction. Anna and I had to call all our courage to our aid. The only missiles that we may be able to secure at our friend's house were pieces of flower pot that had been broken for the purpose. In the heavy silent fog, we reached the official residence without meeting anybody. Then we heard the crash of glass from the preceding group. Immediately there was the shrilling of a police whistle. I flung my pieces of pottery and heard the result of the impact. I dashed across the street to be lost in the fog, to avoid being caught. But then came to my senses, realizing that I was deserting my comrades. I dashed back to Lloyd George's residence and as I threw my last pieces, a policeman actually asked me excitedly, will you stop here while I go and catch her? It's very trusting. Referring to Anna, I laughed heartily and gave the required assurance to the poor man, but I was relieved when we were safely in his care. The police of Westminster District were gentlemen compared to the bullies that Winston Churchill had turned on us at Westminster. They spent a month in Holloway Jail before returning to Ireland, where they continued widespread meetings throughout the country. When the second reading of the Liberal Home Rule Bill was due, without mention of women's suffrage, the League decided it was necessary that more extreme militant action was justified to ensure worldwide publicity. Three members of the Irish Women's Franchise League, Mrs. Connery, Mrs. Hoskins, and Greta, volunteered to break the windows of Dublin Castle. You see a fourth lady here as well, uh, Mabel Purser. Um, you'll hear about her in a second. Greta again, the sound of breaking glass on the 28th of January 1913 reverberated round the world and did what we wanted. It told the world that Irish women protested against an imperfect and undemocratic Home Rule Bill. We were the first women prisoners on behalf of women's demands for their sex in a Home Rule setting. 
The court was crammed for the trial, though the damage to the windows did not amount to five shillings each. We were sentenced to a month's imprisonment as common criminals. We stood up and protested against the status to which we were condemned and demanded to be treated as political prisoners. A classification which had been won by men in the land league and home rule clashes with the English government. A one month sentence was handed down with hard labour. The first night Greta was held in Mount Joy Jail in Dublin, then they were transferred to Tullamore. A fourth suffragette joined them, who had also been sentenced for violent protests, and that was Mrs. Mabel Purser, wife of an eminent physician. Financial circumstances in Ireland became intolerable. Jim had ceased working in the arts and lost his teaching job due to his relationship with the infamous Mrs. Cousins. He was a teacher in the Methodist school uh, uh, in Dublin and they didn't like this, that he was involved with this weird woman. So he was actually sacked or not reappointed uh, with his job. They were impelled forwards to seek their dream of serving in India. The food reform movement resulted in the establishment of health food stores. Hugh Mapleton was a founder and CEO of a factory in Garston near Liverpool. They moved there when Jim was offered a good job with a view to moving to Bombay to establish a branch there. I'm using the old names of the Indian cities because that's what they were called in those days. As you know, they've changed most of them now. And Bombay is Mumbai. Eventually plans changed as a result of the Great War. And they were invited to settle in Adyar, Madras, by the president of the Theosophical Society, Annie Besant. During their stay in Garston, a highly significant event occurred. Uh, basically, most of you have probably never heard of Theosophy, uh, so I put a chapter in the book just to, you know, an overall view of what Theosophy was and is. It's not a religion, it's a society, but it involves bringing religions together and uh, with the goals of seeking unity, um, equality and beauty. So this significant event, going back to Garston, Emily Davison, probably the, the second most uh, famous suffragette of the time after Emily Pankhurst. Emily Davison, who as a protest against the treatment of women's demand and for the securing of publicity that was restricted by those in power, stopped the king's horse in a race by rushing in front of it and was killed on the 8th of June 1913. Six years previously I had spoken with her at the Cobden statue in St Anne's Square in Manchester. That became famous more recently, didn't it? With, remember after the atrocity in Manchester, the whole of the square was filled with flowers, you remember that? She was a college woman and as steady as a rock. She spoke well, but unemotionally, and had a store of historical knowledge. I thought she had no imagination, yet she had thought out a wholly unexpected and individual act of militancy that she knew was almost certain to cost her life or permanent disablement in the service of the cause. I was impelled to attend the funeral. This solemn occasion was final proof that the suffragettes were not out for cheap notoriety. One did not get killed just to enjoy the sensation. There had been a general attitude of giving the suffs enough rope and they will hang themselves. But the epic sacrifice of Emily Davison began to make the public realize that the rope 
was on another neck and that the incomplete and hypocritical old order was itself on the way to a scaffold of its own raising. Another year and some months they embarked from Birkenhead on the good ship, the City of London. It was now 4th of October 1915. They arrived in Madras on the 1st of November. And Jim records, there was deep consolation around both mosquito curtain beds in the realization as we passed into our first sleep on solid and unmoving ground in 28 days that India, India, India was north, south and west of us and that after 10 years of dreaming and aspiring and planning the picture had shifted. So they stayed and worked with uh, Annie Besant and this is the Theosophical uh, headquarters in Adyar outside Madras or Chennai as it now is. I have been there and uh, interesting around the walls here they have symbols of all the great religions. So you can see you know Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, um, Christianity obviously and uh, several of them, Zoroastrianism and also the Baha'i faith. So they're all there because this is their, uh, one of their principles is uh, showing the commonality between all the great faiths of the world. Suddenly, I mean they'd been in India only about a year, when they got news of the Easter Rising, and this was the aftermath in Dublin, it was, oh, I thought it had been a year, I'm sorry, it was five months after arriving in India they received the shocking news from Ireland. And why I read this is because some of those killed were friends of Jim. The news of the rebellion in Ireland came with shocking suddenness and poignancy to us. Now I was reading of the probable first victim of the rebellion, my collaborator, and afterwards my successor in editorship of the Irish Citizen. On the third evening of the outbreak, Frank Sheehy Skeffington went to try and use his influence to keep them from mob violence and from looting. He was not part of the organization of the rebellion, but as a pro-nationalist publicist, he was on the blacklist of Dublin Castle. He was recognized, arrested by the military and summarily shot. Then came the names of others who had met the same fate, who I had known. Patrick Pierce, his brother William, who had acted in one of my plays, James Connolly, Thomas McDonough. One man who also escaped death because he was an American, Eamon De Valera, a name then unknown to me, but destined to become world famous. Now we really get into the Indian part of their service. One day Jim, with his customary intuition, this is Greta again speaking, with his customary intuition of my mental states, what about votes for women? In a hundred years, we may begin to think about it, I answered. My estimate was based on a Western notion of the age-long subjection of Indian women to their menfolk and their consequent backwardness. Now this is interesting. After experimenting with Irish afternoon tea parties, to see what happened by mixing classes and, and the different sects and levels in, in, uh, in India. Both sexes together, which was slightly unusual as well, we formed a group calling itself, and I never get the second word unless anyone speaks Hindi, they, they called it the Abala 
Samaj, the weaker sex improvement society. <coughs> Greta didn't like that title, and it only lasted a few months. And that, so the Samaj model was then taken to form the Women's Indian Association around the uh, area of um, Chennai. Uh, <coughs> and the, the WIA had Annie Besant as the president, a membership of uh, 70 at the beginning, and Greta was the honorary secretary. So that was the beginning of getting Indian women together um, to look at how they can go forwards and seek education, especially for girls, and also to seek votes for women. So later on then, come to 1917, later on that year, during the latter half, Jim noted an announcement in the paper that the Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, all right, Sir Edwin Montague, was coming to join the Viceroy, Lord Chelmsford, in a countrywide survey of conditions throughout India. This was to advance Queen Victoria's long announced goal of self-government for India. He handed the paper to Greta and asked her again, what about votes for women? My reaction to Jim's question was to put out feelers in different directions after such wiring and writing I got an application for a deputation and dispatched it to the organizers of the tour. Our application initially for an opportunity to state the claim for an extension of girls education, that was all, was declined as being outside the terms of the inquiry which was limited to purely political considerations. When I showed Jim the application, he repeated his previous question. What about votes for women? Not a Finally, on the 28th of November 1917, a wire came saying that a deputation of women, of ladies, on the subject of women's suffrage would be received on the 18th of December. Um, yeah, this lady on the right is Sarajini Naidu, who I will mention in a minute. Greta was in no doubt whatsoever of the huge importance of this opportunity. I can tell anybody who wants to know that to have your finger on a turning point in the history of a vast country is no matter of light refreshments. A month in Holloway Jail and another in Tullamore seemed in retrospect rest cures compared with the brain-racking job of having to formulate a demand without precedent in the long history of India. A demand well past the understanding of all but the minutest fraction of those for whom it was being made, and likely to have their opposition, as well as that of men of orthodox and conventional mind. Opposition didn't scare me. What worried me was my ignorance, the colossal reality of India. I was a mere two years in the country. Sarojini Naidu was chosen to be leader and spokeswoman of the deputation as the voice of awakened Indian womanhood. Uh, you can read about her more uh, in the book or Google her. She was a most remarkable woman. She was the equivalent of the female national poet of India, as Tagore was the male equivalent, maybe, of Yeats in our country. She was a very famous um, poet, uh, but that wasn't all. She did an enormous amount of, of other um, work for social change, and she and Greta were very close together and throughout their lives.
At 11 a.m. on the 18th of December, we were ushered in and received with cordiality. The Viceroy struck me as a perfect gentleman, but not impressive as an intellectual quality. The Secretary of State, Mr. Edward Montague, was obviously humane and very intelligent and earnest. Mrs. Naidu read the address as if she herself was composing it as she went along. There was no reply, but four members of the deputation were given private interviews. I, being only the secretary, was not one of them. Greta had written the speech, and Sarah Jeannie delivered it. So that was a historic moment uh, in the progress towards women's votes in India. Only a few sentences are now taken from that historic document. There's more of it uh, in the book. We have asked for a portion of your valuable time because the women of India have awakened to their responsibilities in public life and have their own independent opinions about the reforms that are necessary for the progress of India. We are in touch with the new outlook of Indian women and we make bold at this historic time to lay before you women's views concerning the necessary post-war reforms <clears throat> as we believe them to be the necessary complement to the views of our men. <clears throat> Equal rights are essential. We pray that when such a franchise is being drawn up, women may be recognized as people they hadn't been before and that it may be worked in such terms as will not disqualify our sex but allow our women to be have the same opportunities of representation as our men <clears throat> in October 1922 they were having dinner one evening with the collector in Chintalput district. A collector, he, all over India, the um, British appointed collectors, they took the taxes, but they had a lot of other things. They were quite powerful people, locally. And the um, collector, who was uh, friendly with the cousins, uh, leaned over to her at dinner and said, Mrs. Cousins, would you like to be a magistrate? So again, she saw the, the import of this, and uh, it was the first time a non-Indian woman had been appointed a magistrate in the history of India. And this is on the day that Greta was appointed, there's Greta, and other and representatives. Uh, there's a lot more to that day. All the prisoners seen on that day, I think they had a third taken off their sentences, and. It was a kind of celebration almost on that day, and it was very interesting. She served for five years before other things took over. The climax during the 1920s was the creation of the All India Women's Conference. A certain Mrs. Huda Cooper wrote to Sri Dharma, the journal of the Women's Indian Association, Greta being the editor, took up a suggestion for the creation of a group fighting for justice for all Indian women, once again acting in her established role as a catalyst. If there are two words I associate with Greta, one is feisty and the other is catalyst. And then she drove through with her thoughts and let nothing get in her road. She says, the organizing and carrying out of the answer of the women of India fell to my lot. In the autumn of 1926, I sent out an appeal to form local committees and organize constituent conferences in the provinces and the states. These constituent conferences were to draw up a series of resolutions on education from the point of view of women in two main categories, local and all Indian. 
it was inspiring to collate and condense the remarkable number of expressions right out of the hearts and minds of the women of India and to put them in order for discussion at the very first session of the All India Women's Conference in 1927. Ferguson College in Pune had been generously placed at the disposal of the conference. Its large galleried theatre made a dignified setting for the inaugural meeting. 22 constituent conferences with 5,492 members, not to mention twice the number of sympathisers, sent 58 uh, elected delegates. This was an open session and drew a packed audience of both men and women. Uh, <clears throat> how many have seen the film about the life of Gandhi? Yeah? You may remember that this hall was used in one of the scenes in that film. So I've stood, I stood, I've spoken in that hall. Now this was not the beginning of, these are all men here, I just had a picture, it was the only picture I could find of the gallery theatre. So it's some of them here. But this is Ferguson College, and I want to show you because Anne and I, my wife Anne and I, were invited to the Platinum Jubilee of the AIWC, which was held again in Ferguson College. And by that time, we have a woman as uh, a minister in the government, well there were more women uh, ministers, but this was one of the ministers in the government of India uh, making a speech. I took the photograph, but Anne, my wife, is sitting there wearing a sari in that row there, and this is the Platinum Jubilee. Uh, I took a message from, uh, I'm trying to remember which president, the first time I went I took a message from Mary Robinson, second time was Mary McAleese, who sent a message with me to read out at the at the Platinum Jubilee. And to tell them about Margaret Cummins that you know they didn't really know about her Irish life and where she came from. So we attended that um, Jubilee in two thousand and three. The president of the session, I'm going back to the first one. The Maharani of Baroda arose to the occasion and raised up the whole audience as one. She confessed, I have spent many years of thinking over the problems of Indian womanhood and accepted the invitation to preside as a duty which any woman should be proud to have placed upon her. Our honoured patriots have been straining every nerve for political emancipation. They have relegated social advancement to the background. They have to be painfully reminded of the question raised by the poet Shelley, can man be free and woman be a slave? Without woman's elevation, the progress of man, politically, socially, and even, even economically, can only be lopsided and insecure. Among the resolutions was this one. There are many resolutions. I'm not going to read them all. It's just one. The conference defines education as training which will enable the child and the adult to develop his or her latent capacities to their fullest extent for the service of humanity. It must therefore include elements for physical, mental, emotional, civic, and spiritual development. The courses of study arranged for these purposes must be so flexible as to allow for adaptation to the needs of the individual, the locality, and the community. That was a very forward-thinking um, you know, definition of a rounded view of uh, education. I'm not quite sure if it was that rounded in in our country at that time. I don't know. But it was a very um, complete one. <clears throat> they went to America to do a tour. I'm saying nothing about that, otherwise we'll be here to tea time. But when they were coming back to India, they stopped off in Hawaii. 
during September 1929. While on their way back to India, one opportunity stood. They were invited to attend a meeting, a sessional meeting, of the Pan-Pacific Union of Women. 200 representatives of countries bordering that somewhat large stretch of water had gathered to discuss problems of human organization and had invited Jim and Greta as delegates. Greta noted a significant difference between the joyful and uplifting atmosphere of all AIWC gatherings and what she was observing here. Greta says, there was nothing that led, no vision, only efforts towards responding to material necessity. All quite good, but inadequate because they omitted the raising of the quality of human life on which the quality of its organization ultimately depends. I longed for a touch of reverence, humanitarianism, the grace and beauty of Indian womanhood. Hence, I had a thought. Why not a pan-Asian conference of women in India? Why not indeed? It only needed some person or association to announce the idea and then organize the assured response. Well, our feisty lady <laughs> thought, well, no one else is doing it, I'll do it. After the return to Adyar in India, Jim had a call to go back to the USA asking him to repeat his previous tour. So he left Madras on the 28th of April 1930. Greta felt impelled to push ahead with the launch of the All Asian Women's Conference. Feelers went out and began to attract positive responses for the creation of an All Asian Women's Conference. The invitation was signed by 14 eminent Indian women. The first conference took place between the 19th and the 25th of January, 1931, in Lahore. This is Lahore. Sarojini Naidu had been elected president in absentia because she was still in prison for disobeying various rules at that time. With her temporary absence, it was agreed to have a different president for each day. Forty-five female delegates were present. And it's interesting, I think, to see the, the range uh, uh, of women, oh, sorry, uh, a woman who came from different countries. So you have Lady Bandara Naika from Ceylon. Do you remember her husband became... Was it President Bandera? I seem to remember that name decades ago. Anyone recollect Bandera? Yeah. Uh, there was Mrs. Kamaluddin from Afghanistan, Miss May Wan from Burma, Mrs. Sherin Falstar from Persia. Uh, she was a prominent member in Persia uh, in the Baha'i faith. Dr. Mushalakshmi, sorry, Mushalakshmi from Madras itself, Ms. Hoshi from Japan, and Begum Hamad Ali from North India. So there was a, a range to start with uh, uh, of these um, ladies. Greta later quoted from the report that she wrote afterwards, thousands of men and women attended the opening ceremony of the conference. The reception address was given by the premier, Princess of the Punjab, oh, Sorry, that's my alarm going on. Delete. It's two o'clock, are we okay? Uh, I have another 10 to 12 minutes. Yes, actually, You're okay? I told you I'd go on a little. Unfortunately, granddaughter's called. <laughs> that's all right. I know what granddaughters are like. The reception address was given by the Premier, Princess of Punjab, the Maharani of Kapuratha, and exchange of greetings in many languages and the speeches of noted men and women made a veritable synthesis of Asian kinship in the artistic surroundings of the unique event. 
The resolutions were led by a delegate asking the women of Asia to preserve a high standard of spiritual consciousness uninfluenced by modern materialistic trends. Another expressed the opinion that in order to promote a spirit of religious tolerance, the lives and teachings of great religious leaders should be taught in schools. And a comparative study of the great religions of the world should find a place in college curricula. Now we move rapidly to the League of Nations. September 1931, Jim and Greta were back in Geneva. Their return coincided with the meeting of the League of Nations. Jim described some of the proceedings. I'll read slightly faster. Ireland, in the person of de, um, de Valera, head of the Irish Free State, was to be very much in evidence. He was to preside over the opening of the Council of the League of Nations and was to hand over his presidency to his successor. Greta had a bright idea. It was time that India should make herself heard through free minds and voices instead of through muzzled and tutored officials. The idea found immediate response. An India Day was planned. The Council of the League of Nations was opened on the September the 23rd, and we thought it well to call on the Irish delegation to the League. To our pleasure, the permanent delegation, one man, was Sean Lister, a Belfast man. On close friendly terms with my brother Willie, that's my grandfather, we had a short chat with de Valera. He was interested in Greta's social work and my cultural ad advocacy in India. But the end of our chat was a request that we both come home to Ireland. India Day was celebrated on the 6th of October. Morning saw a business session with an international committee for India was formed. And on the 11th, Greta, after eminent farewells and much packing, left for India. Jim remained in Geneva. She wanted to make contact with the women of Western Asia, so decided to travel by overland via the Persian Gulf. From Jaffa, she was escorted by two Jewish ladies to Tel Aviv, and from there to Jerusalem. Are we okay? Accompanied again, she was taken to one of the famous religious sites and finally to the Hebrew University, ending the day with a successful meeting of the Jewish Women's Association. The New Jerusalem was not at all like my childish imagination when I sang in the Methodist meeting house in the west of Ireland. It seemed to be all shops and sales but no golden gates or hosannas. <laughs> Next morning I drove to Haifa, some three hours away, lunched at the Labour Cooperative Hospital and made a special examination of the maternity and baby wards. In the afternoon I went to see the house and prison of Abdul Baha, the son of the prophet of the Baha'i faith, of whose life and sayings I have been one of the earliest readers in Ireland. On the way, I stopped a driver from brutally whipping a horse. I slept overnight in one of the Baha'i homes in order to have an interview next morning with the current head of the movement, Shoghi Effendi Rabbani. One could see from his quick disposal of items that came and went while we chatted on all sorts of things that he was a born administrator. Uh, this is one of our shrines, I am a Baha'i by the way, uh, in Haifa. And the gardens themselves are a UNESCO, um, what do they call heritage site? Heritage. Yeah, World Heritage Site. A longer drive took her to Beirut. She now names places where we wouldn't dare go to today, you know. Where she spoke of India and its women. The beautiful Nazik Al Abid Beum then took her to her own home. Nazik was known as the Joan of Arc of the Arabs and an activist for women's rights. She was the first woman to earn the rank 
uh, earn a rank in the Syrian Arab army for her role in forming the Red Star Society, which was a precursor of the International Red Cross. Next she headed for Baghdad and was received by the Queen of Iraq on the 27th, accompanied by her two daughters and an English companion. They had a pleasant hour of chat on various topics concerning the place of woman in their country. Moving to Basra after tea, she led a public meeting in the Theosophical Lodge in Basra. And then she caught a ship uh, to come back to India. And she noted a great change in India in the, in the atmosphere. Now, we're near the end. Shortly after Jim had returned to Madhnapali as headmaster, he saw in the newspaper that the young Maharaja of Travancore, who had acceded to the throne in 1931 at the age of 19, known as Maharaja Chathira Thirunal Balarama Varma II, a long title. Something inside Jim moved him to write a letter to the Maharaja expressing the idea that the conjunction of a new reign and a new palace would provide an occasion for giving Indian art the place it deserved in the homes of Indian rulers. <coughs> Nothing happened for a year and then Jim happened to be down giving a humanitarian lecture in Trivendram when contact was made with the Maharaja and her and his mother, and uh, what have I done? I seem to move on. Uh, and um, she was very alert and obviously had many good ideas for making an art museum for the whole of southern India, really, well, uh, Kerala. Come, doctor, she said, taking up a, him up a flight of stairs to the second floor. Jim, by command, subsequently became appointed the art advisor to the Maharaja and the organizer of the Chitralaya, which simply means art museum, which developed into one of the most beautiful art centers in India and still is today. The Sri Chitralam Art Museum was opened by the Maharaja in September 1935 with Dr. James Cousins as the art advisor. I looked it up, it's on the internet, and Jim's name is there as part of the early uh, organizer of the museum. So, you know, you, you can write a letter to someone and you never know where it leads you. I think he had feistiness as well. Right. In 1943, we come now to the end, that Greta took a stroke, and although she recovered her mental faculties to a degree, she knew her years of service were over. They both decided to write down their experiences. These were published, as I said earlier, as We Two Together in 1950. And this current book is a distillation of their book. She attended her final AIWC conference in December 1947. It was the 20th annual session of the All India Women's Conference. It was held in Madras. Jim took her to the opening meeting, and these are his words. She was delighted to see many old friends from various parts of India. She could remember their faces and facts concerning their, them, but could not remember their names. Her halting walk along the path from the entrance of the large temporary hall to the platform became a procession of newcomers anxious to pay their respects to the mother of the conference. Cameramen and reporters, I suppose, you know, like the paparazzi of the day, uh, were all anxious to put the occasion onto newsreels and newspaper blocks. She realized that the organization she had begun had become a national institution of unique achievement and profound influence, and she was satisfied. 
So on the 16th of September 1994, um, Anne and I invited Shobhan Aranadi, the then president of AIWC, to unveil a plaque in Boyle. And that was the plaque that was put up and unveiled on the 16th of September 1994. There's not a lot you can put on a plaque, so it's very limited. And um, we were invited to meet Mary Robinson in Arasaritra, in and she she graciously, um, Shobhana gave her a gift and so on. So it was easier for me when I wrote to Mary Robinson saying, would you endorse the book? Do you remember? And she did. So she was happy to endorse the book, which is nice. And on that evening, it was a very cold evening. I, I felt very sorry for Mrs. Ranaday from India used to temperatures of 35 or 40 sometimes, and you can almost see the goose flesh on her hands. But this is her in the town square reading her speech. And slightly earlier, the town van came out. It was organized by the local council of Boyle. And the mayor was there, etc. Unfortunately, I do have photographs of the, you know, of all the people, you, you know, the great and the good of Boyle, but unfortunately, I mean, I took the photo, it was a dreadful photograph, and it's not, you know, I couldn't even show it, which is sad, I can't resurrect it, but there you are, so we had the band out. Now, I want to end with this uh, paragraph, because to me, the emancipation of women is a long road. It may have started in real earnest in the, in the, uh, in the 19th century, but it is a very, very long way to go. Uh, until men and women together recognize fully and deeply and spiritually if you want the recognition that they are two wings of the same bird of humanity so uh, it's one thing to get the vote and equal pay those are given you know but there's a lot more to come I believe uh, and, um, and different approaches so I'm just going to end by reading this paragraph that was released the, the Universal House of Justice, as part of an 8,000 word document on world peace. The emancipation of women, the achievement of full equality between the sexes, is one of the most important, though less acknowledged, prerequisites of peace. The denial of such equality perpetrates an injustice against one half of the world's population and promotes in men harmful attitudes and habits that are carried from the family to the workplace to political life and ultimately to international relations. There are no grounds, moral, practical or biological, upon which such denial can be justified. Only as women are welcomed into full partnership in all fields of human endeavor will the moral and psychological climate be created in which international peace can emerge. And Dr. Helen Pankhurst was uh, happy to um, contribute this. My thanks for bringing Margaret Cousins' life and work out of the shadows. So many women fought to make a difference to the lives of others, and yet their contributions are being, or have been, forgotten. Hopefully this book will ensure a better fate for Margaret Greta Cousins. That's Dr. Helen. Thank you very much. Thank you.